Okay, great. Just want to thank everybody again for coming to the conference. And uh, like I said earlier, this is kind of an experiment for us with having this two-day conference here and getting uh, a lot of our authors and friends from Adventures Unlimited. I am I'm the owner of Adventures Unlimited. I started it back in the early 80s and uh, as, a, as a publishing company. We now have over 200 books in, in print. We are a major distributor of an importer of, of unusual and esoteric books, particularly ones that have a lot to do with history and archaeology, alternative science, Tesla type of things and whatnot. Myself, I just want to tell you a little bit about me. Um, I was born in France, but my parents are Americans. Um, lived in France for the uh, first three years of my life. I largely grew up in Durango, Colorado, where my, my father's from, and uh, went to high school in Montana. My parents like to travel a lot. In fact, my mother is, is right back there, and she runs the Cottonwood Bookstore, and she's lived in Sedona for quite a few years. And I was fortunate, I, you know, that my parents liked to travel and liked history, so we traveled a lot to Europe and Hawaii and Mexico, went on a cruise in the Mediterranean, and uh, so at an early age, I was, you know, went to a lot of museums and went to Santorini. Uh, I probably like, just like you, I've always been interested in unusual esoteric topics. Grew up as a kid with a heavy dose of uh, Johnny Quest cartoons and kung fu TV shows and the invaders and the sixth sense and all that. And, uh, you know, I, I always liked reading archaeology, history books. Um, Early on, read like Chariots of the Gods by Eric von Doniken, uh, books like The Third Eye by Lob Sangrampa and stuff like that. And, and for me too, I was uh, growing up in the Colorado and Montana, I uh, was a skier, I became a technical climber. I was always very interested in the Himalayas and Tibet and things like that. Uh, I wanted to you know, climb Mount Everest and stuff like that. Um, and it had the dual interest, too, because I was always interested in, like, Tibet and uh, kind of um, unusual things. I wanted to paddle up the Amazon and find lost cities, that kind of thing. <laughs> but the difference between me and a lot of other people who also like to do those things is that I actually went and did all that stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. I got going at an early age. In fact, I, uh, I was going to the University of Montana and I was studying uh, various archaeology, comparative religion, philosophy, and I was taking Mandarin, uh, uh, Chinese, and our, our professor there at the University of Montana was a Catholic priest from China. His name was Father Wong. <laughs> and Father Wong came to class one day and he said, he, he said he'd gotten a letter from one of his old students who was teaching English in Taiwan. And uh, he, he kind of waved this letter in front of class and everything, and he said, well, you know, uh, if any of you want to go to Taiwan and be an English teacher, this is 1976, well, you know, this old student of mine says he'll help you do that. And I went right up to Father Wong after class that day, and I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so I dropped out of school, and I never did get a degree in archaeology, and I began traveling around the world. I, I taught English in Taiwan. I lived, in fact, with the Secretary of the Treasury, just by some fluke, I put an ad in the paper, and uh, he, had act, he had been this general running this Guomindong army in northern Burma, and uh, Sh Limo came every day to pick him up, take him to the, you know, the government offices of Taiwan. But then later I got, went to Hong Kong and Thailand and to Burma and then to Calcutta, had all this climbing equipment and ropes, ice axes, crampons, all this uh, technical climbing stuff, went to Kathmandu, and eventually did go climbing in the Himalayas, and that's what got me going. Spent over five and a half years traveling around the world at that time. Spent two and a half years in uh, Africa. Uh, lived in uh, Kenya and Sudan, later in South Africa. Uh, went back to India and China. Became one of the first people to actually travel around China as when they first opened up. I was I literally just kind of hitchhiking and jumping on trains. Back then you had to go in big tour groups and stuff like that. Eventually returned to the United States, and uh, then I started traveling in, in South America and Central America and things like that. My first book was a book called A Hitchhiker's Guide to African Arabia. I then uh, was kind of a naive author at the time, and, and this was published by Chicago Review Press in Chicago. 
And the publisher one day kind of said to me, he said, look, kid, you know, get real. You know, you can't live off this book. You know, you, you're going to need another job, too. And, uh, and uh, you know, he said, it's not, it's not authors that really make money, it's publishers. So I thought, OK, well, I'll be a publisher then. And, uh, <laughs> and I did. And I started Adventures Unlimited and uh, started writing the Lost Cities books that I'm fairly well known for now. And I've, I'm, in fact, I'm the author of over 20 books right now. One of my most popular books is a book called Technology of the Gods. And uh, got it back there. I became all very interested in Atlantis, in ancient India, the Osirian civilization. The whole idea that uh, civilization is older than 10,000 years old, that, uh, that there were civilizations be before our own. We'll call them at Atlantis. This, uh, this is actually from the Atlantis Resort in the Bahamas, where I was flown to do a TV show uh, with uh, ABC and Disney a couple of years ago. The story of Atlantis really is an Egyptian story, but we get it from the Greek philosopher Plato. And Plato says in, in two of his dialogues, the Timaeus and the Critias, he says that his, uh, his uncle, Solon, who was a Greek statesman, had gone to Egypt, and the priests at Sais in Egypt basically told Solon, they said, uh, you know, you Greeks don't even know your own history. Greece is a much older country than you even realize. And then they go to start telling him about Atlantis. And they say, that, they say that, yes, Atlantis is very specific. It's beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which is uh, the Straits of Gibraltar here. Uh, it, Atlantis was over 10,000 years old. Uh, supposedly, Atlantis fought a war with the Eastern Mediterranean. According to uh, Plato, Atlantis, there were elephants in Atlantis. There, were, uh, there was a kind of a metal called orichalcum, which is this, which is, they believe is some kind of a copper ore. Atlantis has actually been placed all over the world. Uh, it's been placed in the Sahara Desert. It's uh, been placed up in the North Sea and around Ireland and, and Brittany. It's been placed up around Denmark and Sweden. Um, Central uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge of, is a very popular place, naturally, for, for Atlantis. Uh, this is sort of what, it, what Plato and the Egyptians were describing. Edgar Cayce uh, and others have talked about uh, Atlantis and uh, the, the Caribbean, the Bimini, and things like that. Uh, recently, Atlantis has even been placed in places like Indonesia and things like and other places. Uh, Graham Hancock and, and Rand Flamath uh, also took Charles uh, Hapgood's book, Maps, Ancient Sea Kings, and they placed Atlantis in Antarctica. So Atlantis is now under like mile thick of ice or something. I personally have never really uh, gone for the Antarctica location for Atlantis because I, I feel that. Uh, it's just too far from the Mediterranean, and I don't think there were elephants and stuff there. The story of Atlantis, too, is that in Atlantis there was uh, this concentric uh, walls and canals leading into the capital city, and you would, you would enter various locks, and eventually, uh, and it was a huge maritime city, you would eventually uh, reach the inner part of Atlantis where the government buildings were, According to this strange book that was written in the late 1800s called A Dweller on Two Planets, the central building in Atlantis was called the Encolathon. Here you can kind of see here how this is a good concept of the way Plato describes Atlantis. You're coming in from the coast. You have these concentric circles and canals. There was supposedly a very high mountain peak, the north of Atlantis, that, and it was a great plain. And this actually does fit well with like the Azores and things, because there is a giant mountain that's still sticking up. Um, they say that more books have been written about Atlantis than any other subject, except the Bible. Over 20,000 books. And, and when you start getting into Atlantis, you're, this, it's the stories of, of cataclysms, of, of, the, of floods, of uh, con and sinking, and of, and of world before our own. James Churchward, uh, who wrote the books about the Lost Con of Moo, uh, he was, in fact, the inventor of stainless steel. And uh, I mean, he was, a, he was a brilliant guy. He had, he had been a British Army colonel in India in the 1800s. He later lived in Pennsylvania, 
And uh, he had, was told by his teacher in India, this Rishi, to, to was sent on a quest, like, go out and, you know, you're to find this evidence for this lost continent called Mu. And he began traveling through the Pacific in the late 1800s, which was very expensive at the time. You, you had to be really quite wealthy and have a lot of time to do that. But this is Churchward's map here, where uh, he placed Atlantic in the middle of the Atlantic and the ridge, and uh, the uh, people from uh, Atlantis and Mu going all over the world and, and populating the world. This is here. We have uh, the famous Bimini Road that's underwater. Um, it's only about 30 feet deep, really. But this, the stones that are there are kind of curious. One of the things with mainstream geology, of, this is also at Bimini, one of the, the stones that, that come out of there. Edgar Cayce had said that there were three halls of records around the world uh, in which Atlanteans had put uh, these kind of ancient libraries. He, he said that one was near Bimini, one was uh, somewhere around the Sphinx in Egypt, and the third one uh, in the Yucatan. Uh, they, the Edgar Cayce Foundation is, is looking around a, a city called Piedras Negras there. Sunken cities are found all over the world. And in fact, there's over 200 known sunken cities in the Mediterranean alone. And, uh, the, and this is mainstream archaeology. Uh, just re in the last few years, they've found uh, a number of cities that are Egyptian cities that are out in the Mediterranean. They're, uh, they're about 30 kilometers out into the Mediterranean now. This is a city that's a megalithic city that's underwater called Elephanisos. It's in the Peloponnese in, uh, in Greece and the Aegean. And in fact, the whole idea of the Aegean, with, uh, there are certain maps, like Hapka talked about it, of showing like fewer islands and that the whole Aegean being flooded. Uh, you have also the story of, of Thera here, this island that, that blew up. And we'll get into that in a minute. As you go also in, um, in Brittany and France, you, where you have Karnak, and, and then in the English part, uh, you have Land's End, you have uh, sunken ruins and cities in this area between France and England. Uh, on the French side, there's a, a land called Is, Y-S, that is this legendary sunken area like Atlantis. And then on the British side, you have uh, what's called the Gilly Islands or, and, the, and the Lioness, which is also this lost land. Around Karnak and Brittany, giant rows of stone just go into the ocean, and they weren't really built there. According to mainstream archaeologists today, the oldest ruins in the world are in Malta. Mainstream archaeology is saying that the ruins on Malta go back about 9,000 years to 7,000 or, or even 8,000 BC. And that is getting very old. This is getting into the times of Atlantis. So, kind of, so the whole concept of what we were taught, uh, say, in, in high school or, or something, that you know, civilization started in Sumeria uh, six or 7,000 years ago, and that before that, everybody were cavemen kind of a thing. But so they're, they're more or less proving that wrong. And more and more, even mainstream archaeologists keep pushing back civilization, the, the builders megalith building. Malta is a good example. Now, Malta was apparently hit by a massive tidal wave in prehistory. And what happened was the Mediterranean in that time, which uh, some people have called uh, the Mediterranean and North Africa, this area, the land of Osiris. And this was during, allegedly during Atlantean times. You had Atlantis out in the Atlantic and may well have been part of North and Central America or something. But the Mediterranean itself was, a, was like a, a valley with lakes in it. And then what happened was, and the evidence is there at Malta, where this massive tidal wave hit the Mediterranean and in, in theory, with the sinking of Atlantis, wiped out Malta and there were, there were rhinos and, and small elephants and stuff that were living on Malta. Today, Malta is just a small little island. They were washed into this cave. And the whole Mediterranean was wiped out at that time and essentially filled with the Mediterranean. You'll see some shows now on Discovery Channel about the Black Sea in a similar way. And they're saying that the Black Sea was also had much lower ocean levels. Uh, along these lines, uh, with, when you have um, uh, 
the whole idea of ocean levels having something to do with, with these previous civilizations, Atlantis. According to mainstream geologists, 10,000 years ago during the last ice age, they say that ocean levels were 300 feet lower than they are today. And what, what you have, when you, what civilizations tend to build cities where rivers meet oceans. And this is, is, is very typical. So if you had a city 10,000 years ago, and you were building it as we would normally build it today, where uh, rivers meeting the ocean, those cities are going to be 300 feet underwater, uh, I mean, according to mainstream geology. And I'll, and I'll repeat one more time that there are over 200 known sunken cities in the Mediterranean alone. One of the things that I've always fascinated me as I travel around the world is, is megalith building, giant stone blocks, huge quarries. Uh, you, you see this all over the world. The largest known cut stone blocks and, that have been moved and actually placed are at the uh, Temple of Baalbek, which is uh, today in Lebanon. And there, these, those blocks, which are some of these blocks right here, they call them the trilithons of this massive platform, which is actually, a, mainstream historians say the Romans built this, but they don't know how. These stones weigh about uh, 2,000 tons each. Uh, not even known cranes can lift these blocks. In my book on lost cities of Atlantis, uh, ancient Europe and the Mediterranean, I have this illustration. The only way they could figure out how they might have moved these giant blocks at Baalbek was to use what they call Allen uh, cuts, which are little uh, sort of um, wedge-shaped cuts into a stone, all right, so that you can put sort of a triangular stone into these wedges. They, in theory, I mean, they're just trying to figure out how they did this. So the, the, what mainstream archaeologists are saying, they built this giant cage over these huge blocks of stone that are, you know, they're like the size of this wall. They're the size of a railway car. And they would build this giant cage over it. The cage would have all of these pulleys. There would be hundreds of them. They would have all these little, small, what they called Allen cuts. And then all these people would be moving. And then, even then, they would move these blocks a few inches. And then they would have to do it all again. So, I mean, it's, it, and this is one of the things that we're going to keep discussing today is how, how did people do this? Why? Would they apparently go through such tremendous effort, even, to, to try and build like this? It seems uh, kind of a defeatist kind of thing. One of the mysterious uh, civilizations that, that existed in, in ancient times that we're still trying to figure out is the Hittites. The Hittites uh, were megalith builders in central Turkey. This is a Hittite inscription that is a hieroglyphic. And the Hittite inscriptions are interesting because it's what's called a Bustafidan uh, uh, pattern where the, you would read, it's like the Oxpots, you would read one line left to right, the next line right to left, right, left to right, le right to left, like that. It's an unusual way of writing. Hittites did it this way, the Doric Greeks also wrote this way. On Easter Island, the strange Rongo Rongo tablets on Easter Island have never been deciphered. They are also written in this unusual as the ox plows pattern. The Hittites themselves, where this is an interesting story with, with North America, in, uh, in, in 1896, a farmer up in the upper peninsula of Michigan near to Lake Superior was pulling out stumps from his, uh, his farm, and he found two unusual stone statues and a tablet right here, and it's called the Newberry Stone Tablet. And it was a stone tablet and it was written with these unusual uh, hieroglyphs and languages on it. And this is actually a picture of the stone here. Uh, no one knew what this tablet was or even what language it was written in. And it was sent to the Smithsonian Institution for uh, deciphering and, and just identifying like, where this thing came from. The Smithsonian Institution couldn't identify it. And they sent it back to Michigan to the owners saying, we don't know what this thing is. We don't know where it came from. Later, Dr. Barry Fell was able to decipher the, the tablet. He was a Harvard University professor and uh, president of the Epigraphic Society. And he said, yeah, this is ancient Hittite. 
and then he would decipher the stone. Meanwhile, the stone had been, it'd already been rejected by the Smithsonian Institution. It sat in a, in a barn in Upper Michigan for uh, you know, 50, 60 years. People kept chipping away at it, little souvenirs, until there was hardly anything. Fortunately, we have a photo of it. The interesting thing with this Hittite tablet uh, in Upper Michigan is that the Hittites themselves weren't discovered until 1910. So there's no way anyone could have faked this tablet. I mean, it would have been, you would have been faking a language that no one knew about yet. <laughs> Which is kind of like the, a similar stone like this is also in Minnesota called the Kensington Rune Stone, all right, where it's written in Viking runes. And mainstream archaeologists will say, well, you know, the Vikings got to Labrador or Newfoundland, but they weren't in, you know, Oklahoma or Minnesota or places like that. But they do have, they have runes, stones, kind of like this. So now they can say, well, you know, these Scandinavian farmers, you know, they're just decided they want to create an elaborate hoax, so they're making these rune stones. But they can't make that claim with the Newbury Stone because no one could have possibly have um, actually faked it at the time. So now we have the idea that these, you know, Hittites, ancient seafarers are traveling around the oceans. They're going to, you're going to get in a boat. The whole idea that oceans are, are not barriers, but that, that's kind of what we're taught. The oceans are barriers. You just can't get into a boat and go somewhere. Well, you've got to walk everywhere, you know, and uh, all American Indians have to somehow walk from Siberia all through North America, mm -hmm. down through Central America, thousands of miles of hostile tribes. But you can't get in a boat and just go somewhere, you know. But that, that's the whole idea. I mean, boats are, and oceans are highways, not barriers. Now, this is right here, where this will be something that we'll talk about a little bit in the next hour as we go along, is this what are called keystone cuts and the clamps that go into it. And in fact, this is part of the building of the Parthenon. So you're building with giant megalithic blocks, but you're putting these clamps in there. You're making these cuts, and you pour molten metals in here. And we're going to keep seeing that as we go along. The Sphinx and the Pyramid, uh, you, you, you do see keystone cuts here. Uh, they're, um, Geologists and some Egyptologists are now saying that, that the Sphinx and the, the pyramids are over 10,000 years old. This is the valley temple of, uh, that's near to the Sphinx, and it has some pretty interesting uh, granite megalithic construction. This is actually granite with an unusual piece of black basalt right here. But we're going to see here. Now, if you look here, the way that this this structure is built, and this is probably pre-Egyptian, over 10,000 years old. But like the corners here where blocks are notched in and locked in together, and they're, they're fit perfectly. And we're going to see more and more of this kind of construction. This is also at the Valley Temple near the Sphinx. So notice these kind of telltale jigsaw cuts, locking blocks in in a, in a jigsaw pattern. This is key, and this is a kind of an earthquake-proof type of construction that is it's by far the most advanced form of building that, that we know of. And it's, and it's how the ancients built things. This is the Osirion at Abydos in, in southern Egypt. This is also where the, the famous Flower of Life is. And uh, this is a building, too, that is pre-Egyptian built out of massive blocks of granite. It has also, as we'll, we'll notice here, the Egyptian government spent years pumping this out. But notice here again, these little notching of the blocks. Rather than having them as level, even blocks like bricks, um, where each block is uh, uniform and in layers, they're not building like that. They're, they're locking little blocks in with these corners. Something else that's curious at the Osirion are these little knobs and things like that that you see on these giant blocks. And they don't know what those are for. Here we are, some other blocks here in the Osirion. More over here. Notice here the blocks, the way the doors are cut. Uh, this is really an amazing structure. And it's the Egyptians themselves built their Temple of Abydos here because this other earlier structure was, was sitting here. All right, now we're going to go completely across the world to the mountains in the, in the Andes, where this is in Cuzco in Peru. This is, in fact, the very famous stone of, of 12 angles that appears on the Cuzcania beer bottle, in fact, uh, which I know well. 
Uh, <laughs> and uh, you'll notice here, I mean, this is really a famous stone. It's perfectly fitted. It's got 12 angles. I mean, they, and they really want, they want to lock these blocks in, smaller little blocks here, all perfectly fitted. Notice here again these little knobs and things on the stone. They, it's, it's a curious thing. They, stonemasons, archaeologists, I've never really figured it out. They have different theories. It may well have something to do with the construction. Here too, in the, in the Andes, we have more of this perfect uh, stone building and fitting these blocks in. This is a street also in Cusco. You can even see different levels of building, that's, and it's all quite good, but it seems to be done at different times. The lower levels are always the largest stones. They're, they're always the most perfect building. So rather than, rather than the building getting better, this is the same thing in Egypt too, uh, the getting better, it gets worse as time goes by. And the oldest buildings are the by far the most superior and, and better built. This building will just jump actually to Japan real quick. This is the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo at Edo. And once again, we'll see here this, this curious jigsaw pattern of fitting these blocks perfectly together. Now, in areas like the Andes and Japan, where you have a lot of heavy earthquakes, you get the shock wave of an earthquake hitting these buildings. Now, brick kind of construction is, is like the, the poorest to withstand an earthquake. Because of the uniform lines of bricks, and, uh, they will shear. And uh, uh, some big brick building is going to fall down during an earthquake. But not buildings like this. The blocks aren't using mortar. They're locked in like a jigsaw puzzle. They hold together, and no doubt, in the Andes and in Japan and all over the world, uh, they know hundreds of huge earthquakes have hit these walls, and they're still perfectly locked together. And although some buildings have been destroyed, and, and, and those must be some pretty powerful earthquakes. Above the, this is Cuzco itself. Cuzco, in many ways, in my mind, is like an Atlantean city that's still occupied today. People are still living in these buildings built thousands and thousands of years ago. Mainstream archaeologists don't quite get it. They actually say that these buildings were built only a few hundred years before the Spanish conquered Peru. I mean, and, and that they're like from uh, uh, 1200 AD or something like that. Right on a hill above Cuzco is the, the what they call it, the giant fortress of Sacsayhuaman. It is built out of massive uh, blocks of stone. There was a tower, kind of like the round towers of Ireland. There was one at Machu Picchu, too, at the top. Giant blocks weighing not as big as Baalbek, but they're still weighing uh, 100 tons, 200 tons. The ones at Baalbek are 2,000 tons. They, there was a stonemason who worked uh, for the University of California at Berkeley, and it was his job to go and try and figure out how the Incas could have possibly built these things. And I mentioned this in my book on lost cities, uh, ancient mysteries of South America. And you know, there's a mathematical formula. If you just get enough, you know, thousands of people hauling on some giant block of stone, you know, if you just get enough people doing that, yeah, there's, you know, you're going to be able to move this stone. And he was, he was figuring all this out with his equations. The problem that he ran into was he couldn't figure out where all those thousands of people stood. There just wasn't room for them to all be standing there pulling on these ropes and stuff. So now we have, I mean, so particularly when with what you have in Peru, you've, you've got a, a, a real archaeological anomaly because you've got these huge megalithic cities but they're not even 2,000 years old, according to archaeologists. They're, they're, they're very recent. But the Incas supposedly didn't know about the wheel. They allegedly hadn't invented writing and stuff yet. I mean, they were, were not, uh, allegedly, you know, these sophisticated uh, builders like we, we, we might credit the Egyptians to being. This is Machu Picchu, the, uh, one of the great tourist attractions in, in South America. Machu Picchu is a megalithic city. It is a secret city built on top of a mountain. 
uh, the, even the conquistadors themselves never found Machu Picchu. Uh, they, would, they would go uh, along the Urubamba River for many, uh, I mean, for years, but they never knew about this city. This is the, uh, the famous uh, uh, room of three windows. It, too, is built out of megalithic blocks, perfectly fitted together, huge lichen patches. If we look over here on this wall, once again, we see this jigsaw megalithic building that's so distinctive, the notching of blocks here, small blocks here. As you get towards the top, though, you see how the construction becomes a lot cruder, smaller stones. So here's another close-up of that. Giant blocks of stone. Here again, this is on the inside. We'll see again these, these small, unusual knobs and things like that that appear on the stones. All very curious. Giant block here that's quite square. Other blocks around it. This wall is pulling apart, uh, possibly from earthquakes and things. This is all right around Machu Picchu. Um, really fine excellent construction that, that's mind-boggling. And stonemasons all over the world go here just to look at this. But it's like the Hittite uh, and what you see in Egypt. Huge blocks. Even they, we don't know why they had built you know, rooms like this, all locked in the way these blocks are. Giant lichen patches. It's, it's quite curious. My favorite place in Peru is a town called Ollante Tambo. And it's in the Sacred Valley going down the Urubamba towards Machu Picchu. And up at the top of uh, the, at the Sun Temple at Ollante Tambo is some very, very curious uh, megalithic remains. And we'll look at those right now. As you go up these large terraces up to the top of the mountain at Ollante Tambo, you start going up these steps. And you once again see what are uh, granite blocks perfectly fitted together, huge, huge lichen patches. It's all extremely well made. You see once again these telltale knobs that are so unusual and mysterious. You see again the way the blocks are locked in. And it's, uh, it's really some, some amazing stonework that's, uh, that, that kind of boggles the mind. You have a door, you come along that. Once again, you see, can't even slip a piece of paper, no little notchings here. I mean, they did a lot of unusual things to lock these blocks in as, uh, and the corners and things like that. Really, really excellent stonework. Now here, we'll look at this door. Here again is the perfect megalithic fitting of the blocks, the unusual knobs, the corners. And now look up here. We have what is essentially kind of this kind of crummy rubble. Well, we're going to see more of that. So this, in my mind, you know, as, as I try and make a dent in you know, mainstream archaeology and history of, of, of trying to reform, I mean, some of what I think are, are bad ideas, uh, Ollante Tambo is, is crucial to a lot of this. Now, when you get up to the top of the Sun Temple of Ollante Tambo, what you find are all these giant blocks of red granite, uh, known as andesite, extremely hard stone. And they're like stacked up here. This is the main thing that people see. It's, it's basically just a wall of red granite. It's perfectly fitted together. It has some unusual construction in it, too, because it has these very thin uh, slabs that uh, are between each of these massive stones here. And, and we don't know, again, why they're building like this or doing this kind of thing. Notice over here, there's like a tenon joint on the edge. This block has fallen away. Uh, this joint here would have had another socket that another massive block would have fit into. This, this photograph right here is, is, in a way, kind of proves how unscientific and just plain wrong you know, mainstream archaeologists are about Peru and stuff. Here's what they're saying, all right? They're saying that, well, the Incas, we're talking like 200 years before the Spanish got there. The Incas dragged, cut these giant blocks. By the way, they come from a quarry up on a mountain across a river. Uh, I mean, it's pretty far away. So the Incas are dragging these giant blocks up here, OK? And this, what you're seeing right now is exactly how it looked in Inca times, all right? And it, it, it's how it looks today. It's how it looked when the Spanish first got there. It's how it was during Inca times, just like this. No one has moved it or done anything, all right? 
Now, mainstream archaeologists are saying, like, well, yeah, they put this giant block right here. Notice how it's like notched up here. But then they just filled it in with this crummy rubble right there. Okay? <laughs> Same over here. You know, I mean, this is what they're saying. I mean, this is, these are the professors at Harvard and Yale, University of Arizona. University. This is what they're saying. So the Incas, I mean, they're going through this gigantic effort to drag these, you know, 100-ton, 1,000-ton blocks up here. They've got it notched over here for another giant 100-ton block to be perfectly fitted to it, but they don't fit it. They just fill it in with this crummy rubble. <laughs> You know, and it's like, yeah, that's, well, that's, that's how the Incas did stuff sometimes. They just, you know. <laughs> right, it's the crummy. I mean, so these blocks are all sitting here. You see them notched and stuff like that. Well, it's obvious that, you know, this giant block was meant to have another giant, huge block perfectly fitted to it. This is Inca construction right here. Yeah. That's Inca construction, okay? Here's more Inca construction over here. These giant blocks, that is, you know, Atlantean construction, as, as I would call it. So now we're back, okay, so we're looking around. What we were seeing was right around that corner. We see again these thin blocks right here. Again, the strange knobs and stuff like that. You see, we, they can't really explain like, why they would do this. It has a small stair step thing here. Uh, very similar to what's at Tiwanaku. Here again, you see how they've taken a, this block, which was meant to be up here, and then, uh, but then they've, they've kind of put this stuff around here. Once again, now we're, we're seeing this wall as we go along the side. The giant block that's notched. Here's the crummy Inca construction right here with the giant Atlantean things. This block, too, we were looking at it here being notched. Why these uh, little pillow-shaped things coming out, we don't know why that is. Once again, these big blocks here, they're just sitting there. This is how it was in Inca times, how it was in uh, Spanish times. People came up here, and even today, modern archaeologists, they can't, they can't get a crane up here. Now, even today, modern construction crews aren't going to move these blocks. They couldn't. Standing next to them, this is coming around the other side. You see this, particularly at this site, you just have this very odd juxtaposition of this huge megalithic building that was never completed, and then with this really crummy rubble kind of construction that goes along with it. You see how these blocks are very well uh, shaped and, and uh, like machined, the edges. Uh, someone is going through tremendous effort to quarry these blocks, to dress them extremely well. But yet they never were able to complete this structure. Something happened that all the construction just came to a halt and was never completed. We're still at Ollante Tambo. These are some of the... Uh, giant blocks there, and here, these are what are called the keystone cuts that we were seeing before. Uh, just this unusual way of fitting giant blocks together. You're going to have a keystone cut on one side, you're going to have it on the other side, and then you're going to pour metal clamps in there. So you're going to always have, whenever you have a, a keystone cut like this, it has to have a, a joining block next to it with an identical keystone cut, and then you're going to pour molten metal in there. And the metal, the metal is, is, is just plain always gone. Here again, the giant blocks. And there's a very unusual way of fitting things, giant blocks together. You see it in, you see it in ancient Greece. You see it in, in Egypt. You see it at, even in, in Angkor Wat. You see it in Peru. For, and now, again, mainstream archaeologists are saying, well, all these people just independently invented this unusual way of joining blocks. Because there can't be any connection to any of these uh, uh, blocks. This was a block also that never made it to Ayante Tambo, the, 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 the sun temples up here. This quarry for all these blocks is this mountain up here. It's about a day hike from the town of Ayante Tambo. You have to cross a river, you go along this trail up here, the trail finally zigzags, you get up into this area, it's like this whole mountain has been blasted and massive blocks of granite have kind of fallen down as scree, but they're huge. And when you're up there, I've, I've been there once, you, you see even huge dressed blocks that are uh, you know, squared and getting ready to move down this mountain. They actually would have to take it across this river and then back up this other mountain, which would be to Ayantitambo. 
This is, we're still in Peru, this is a Landsat uh, satellite photograph taken of the eastern jungles of Peru in the Madre de Dios area. And if you look in this area here, what appears to be kind of an egg carton kind of shape, this is uh, a set of eight or ten giant pyramids that are in this jungle. It's, uh, the Peruvian government has flown helicopters out here. They think that there's some kind of lost city out in this jungle area. This extremely remote part of Peru going towards the uh, Brazil uh, border in the, in the jungles there. There aren't roads and things. Expeditions have gone out into this area to go to these pyramids and have vanished and never come back. Sort of the lost expedition type thing. So there can really still be a lot of stuff, particularly in the, the, what they call the Alto Selva, the high jungle mountain areas, which is the whole eastern slope of the Andes going into the Amazon basin. We're now in this area here. We're, we are near to um, Puno, Peru. We're right by Lake Titicaca. This is this unusual door that is built into this thing this is about 20 feet high. It's, um, I think that's Doug Nason maybe standing there, who's one of our presenters. And uh, it's carved, it's like, a, it's like a false door that's been carved into this uh, rock face there near Peru. It's sometimes called uh, the, the devil's door, the door of Amaru, um, I always say that wrong. I, I, I Aramumu Ru, whatever. So that, and you know, people have thought, it's become quite famous, in fact, and uh, Mark will talk more about this too, I know. And uh, it's, as a stargate, people go here and med meditate, it's maybe some interdimensional gateway or something. And it's quite a curious thing, it's just carved into this, these blocks. The Egyptians did the things like this too. Um, I was noticing when we were in Egypt recently, of these false doors and things like that that don't go anywhere, and that's, that's typically there in Peru. On Lake Titicaca, you have um, it's the highest navigable lake in the world. There are, um, there are megalithic remains that are underwater in Lake Titicaca. The Lake Titicaca is also an area of the, the reed boats and reed ships. The Egyptians built reed ships, the Moroccans. Thor Heyerdahl, the Norwegian explorer, was famous for building these reed ships and sailing across the oceans and things like that. Reed ships have, have advantages over other ships in that, they're, one, they're unsinkable. Uh, reed ships, even if they break up, all the pieces will float because they're built out of hollow things. Reed ships also have a very shallow draft, and they're good for the Pacific in that you can go right over coral reefs and things like that in a reed ship really well. The best reed ships are built in uh, Lake Titicaca, and Thor hired will actually use Bolivians and took them to Morocco to build his Egyptian ships raw because the, the reed builders that he found in North Africa and Egypt were not, just couldn't make as good as ships anymore. This is a curious thing too. This is a lake near to Cuzco. I like talking about this one. This is a lake, a small lake called Huayna Laguna. And it is a lake that according to the locals, UFOs come out of this lake almost every night. And in the middle of this lake, what I'm told, uh, is there's like a hole in this lake. And it's very deep. And you, you, they, locals claim this. And I, I've been told this a number of times by people. And, and whenever I have a chance, I pass this lake, I always ask the bus driver or somebody, what about that lake? And, and they always give the same story. And what they claim is that late in, in the, at night, like 4 in the morning kind of thing, people will see lights and discoid craft coming up out, out from the water on this lake. And it's right near Cusco. Many tourists pass it all the time. Um, there's two roads out of Cusco to the Sacred Valley, and one goes right by this lake. Lake Titicaca itself now is, is about another 1,000 feet in the Andes, much, much bigger than that, than the Huayna Laguna. And Lake Titicaca also has a lot of stories of UFOs, um, church word believed that uh, Tiwanaku II was originally connected to the ocean and had been raised up to 12,000 feet in the Andes. Right near uh, the south end of the lake is Tiwanaku. There's the Gate of the Sun over here. Tiwanaku has been largely reconstructed by Bolivian archaeologists who did a terrible job of reconstructing it. 
And because it was a megalithic city, they couldn't build that way, so they didn't. Tiwanaku was, uh, was, a, was a pyramid city. It had sunken temples. The famous Kontiki was here. It was, um, apparently it was a metallurgical uh, area that where, uh, what, what largely was for processing ores and making metals. There were sluices. There was an underground river that they had uh, diverted here to wash out ores and stuff like that. And here at the museum, yeah, they, they go diving. There are sunken ruins and things like that around the lake. Jacques Cousteau, one of his episodes, too, was he goes to Lake Titicaca. One of the strange things about Lake Titicaca, and you see this museum, is that there is a type of a seahorse that lives in Lake Titicaca. And seahorses do not live in like high you know, mountain lakes and stuff like that. They live in the ocean. But there is a type of seahorse in Lake Titicaca, which lends some credence to the idea that at one point, Lake Titicaca may have actually been connected like, with the Pacific Ocean and was at, at sea level. Um, Lake Titicaca, in, in that theory, with the Andes rising up, Lake Titicaca being a, a saline, uh, oceanic, uh, lake at the time, but as the waters from the Andes all came in, it, the salinity of the lake eventually uh, became less and less, it became a freshwater lake. And there's another lake called Lake Popo that's also just south of Lake Tiwanaku, and it's all salt. So all the salt from Lake Tiwanaku went actually into the southern lake. From the back of uh, the Gate of the Sun, the, and the Gate of the Sun was apparently moved from Puma Punku in ancient times, which is a couple of miles away. And it was placed in the main ruins of Tiwanaku, where people would see them. This is the gate, the, the, the sun. You can see also it's notched over here. Other giant blocks would be fitted here. But they were like moved. And in the sunken temple at Tiwanaku, there's all of these heads that are fixed here. Their thought is said that every race uh, of mankind has been is represented there. There are some very strange um, stones, uh, statues at Tiwanaku. One of the things they do, particularly these guys, they're wearing turbans, strange goggle-eyed, sort of like fish pants, sort of like Sumerians. They have also a kind of an Egyptian thing, too, where they have two left hands. And that's, that's something that a lot of Egyptian iconography was just curious to them, where you'll, you'll see a person in profile, but both their hands are left hands. You know, it wouldn't be properly done as a left hand or right hand. And this guy is like that too. This is down in here. You can see part of the underground tunnels and things like that that were part of Tiwanaku. There's a, there's a whole network here. You see giant blocks also fitted together down here. This is kind of new that they've been excavating here. So apparently at Tiwanaku, I mean, they were washing ores. Water was running through it and uh, probably um, uh, they were essentially processing iron and other metals. This is the famous uh, Khan Tiki statue. Notice he's bearded and has a mustache. Uh, American Indians do not have uh, beards and mustaches. They can't really grow facial hair. Uh, tomorrow, we'll, Doug Nason, our Tiki expert, will be no doubt talking about quite a bit of that. Near to the main site of Tiwanaku is the Puma Punku site, which is just about a mile or so away. At Pumapunku, you have these giant blocks of red granite scattered around. You'll also see the keystone cuts like we were uh, seeing at Ayantitambo, also in Egypt. And here we have this giant structure, also made out of 100 ton, 1,000 ton stone blocks. But it has been destroyed. And it's like some kids' building blocks have just been scattered and, and, and wiped out in some cataclysm. Here we can see what we were talking about earlier, the keystone cuts, how they have to be on a corresponding um, block. So now we, the mainstream archaeologists have a problem because they, they do admit that Tiwanaku is pre-Inca. They, they admit, now the Incas didn't build this, but they still don't think it's that much older. They, they conservatively, um, they say that at Tiwanaku it's maybe 2,000 years old, something like that. Uh, Poznansky and, and Graham Hancock talked about that in his book, Fingerprints of the Gaza, that from an astrom astronomical viewpoint, they think that uh, Tiwanaku is like 15,000 years old. 
One of the things they told me too at, when I met archaeologists from University of Berkeley at Tiwanaku is that they cannot figure out how the, the blocks were cut and, and uh, dressed and things like that because they, they just don't feel that the, the ancient Tiwanaku people had the, the tools to cut it. As you go along here, there's again the Puma Punku site. You see these giant blocks. The whole thing's been hit by a massive wall of mud. You can see here too, like, uh, all right, this is a typical trenching ar uh, from an archaeological dig where they just dig a trench, see if they can find something underneath it. And what they find are giant blocks of stone all fitted together. Notice here, keystone cuts coming in here. Uh, there's a good 15 feet of mud just deposited on it from some tidal wave or something like that. And you can see again, like these blocks, like they've it's this, some tidal wave from Lake Titicaca just hit this building and wiped it out. And uh, today, these giant blocks are just kind of sitting here on you know, top of a bunch of mud and, and muck. How far inland is that? Uh, oh, we're, we're 12,000 feet in the Andes. And, well, but we're near the shore of a large lake. And it would have been, in theory, a tidal wave from one of these, these lakes. This is what uh, the blocks and what a keystone cut looks like with a clamp in it. We don't find these clamps that often because one of the things that happens, and this is, this is pretty much you know, why Cuzco is still occupied and uh, say the Incas would have occupied Machu Picchu, things like that, is you're some wandering tribe. There's been some cataclysmic changes. Uh, the world that you knew before doesn't exist. Um, you know, the factories and the metal workers and the, the market used to go to, they're not there anymore. And, uh, and so now you're a wandering tribe and you just suddenly you come and here are these giant buildings. And uh, some of them are destroyed, some are still standing. And you're going to, you see these clamps, you're going to take them. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to try and get that clamp out of that rock and then you're going to hammer a spearhead or a, a sword or a dagger or something out of it. So that's what happens to these things. This is what they think Puma Punku actually probably looked like. Uh, an amazing building. I mean, built by some of the, the finest architects in the world. Um, and, it, and no doubt this building is, is over 10,000 years old for sure. The, um, about a year ago, I was in Switzerland with, with Eric von Doniken at his mystery park and stuff, which was, that was all pretty cool. And they do a very nice video that really impressed me about Puma Punku and all these blocks here. And they were showing how that these blocks are ingeniously made and in a uniform way, almost like Lego or something, where they could manufacture all these blacks, blocks and they all just fit together perfectly and, uh, and stack up and you, you create these, these buildings. But how they would machine and create all these blocks is, is kind of the thing. So here we go. These are the clamps and things like that to go into the Keystone Cuts. There at the museum at Tiwanaku. This is supposedly uh, what at least some of the guys at Tiwanaku look like. He looks very much like a Aymara or Quechua Indian wearing a turban. And the statues at Tiwanaku too are turbans. Supposedly in Atlantis, people also uh, turbans were um, like the style, a kind of a knotted turban up front. This guy here, uh, this is also Tiwanaku. He looks very Oriental right here. This guy up here, also from Tiwanaku, he looks very Western with his beard and mustache. Uh, neither of these guys look like American Indians at all. You, you also see a lot of tree pan skulls where the, the holes have been uh, cut in the skulls. And the this elongated skulls, the, what, you know, the, the cone head type of a thing. So all over the Particularly in Peru, you can still see in the museums and stuff, a lot of these very strange, strange skulls that are really elongated. Um, why they did this is, it's a mystery, but it's something that is like worldwide. These are from Ica, this along the Peruvian coast here. These, these guys, very, very uh, elongated skulls. And uh, I mean, it's, they kind of look like aliens or something like that. And it, why they did this, we don't really know. It's, it's something that did, was done uh, all over the world, in fact. Uh, Egyptian, this is a skull here that's an Olmec skull uh, in, in Mexico. These are Olmecs too. Some statues, you see also how it shows how they have these 
elongated skulls right here. And, and they believe that these guys were the elite. So either they, were kind, they wanted to have skulls like this. Now, there is a way that we can take, before children have their, the, their skulls totally fuses and knits, you have plates in your head, and you can manipulate the skull and elongate it. Um, it it's, a, it's almost like a fetish in a way. Uh, the Chinese would do foot binding, where they felt that women with small deformed feet were sexy. The Mayans did a strange thing too. They thought that women who were cross-eyed were uh, more attractive, so they would, they would hang a small ball in front of a baby that they would look at and they would, they would force them to become cross-eyed. Went to high school in Montana, and at, at north of uh, Missoula, Montana is the largest freshwater lake in the United States, west of the Mississippi, and it's called Flathead Lake. Well, it's called Flathead Lake because the Flathead Indians lived around there. And they were called the Flathead Indians because they also did this. And they elongated their skulls. Also, the Chinook Indians around um, Seattle also did this. And the, also, the Kurds and people like that um, would do that, too. And now here we are. This is now an Egyptian. This is one of Nefertiti and Akhenaten's daughters. This is they, they probably Meritaten or Ankhesenpaten. But this is what she looked like. And what Tutankhamun, too, also had one of these elongated skulls like that. This is a very oddness thing. Um, but you, and so uh, Nefertiti, by the way, was not really an Egyptian. She was from Mitanni, which was a kind of northern Iraq, uh, you know, south central Turkey area. This is Tutankhamun. He also had an elongated skull like this. By the way, Tutankhamun was found uh, with a full trunk of boomerangs in his tomb, among other things. And here we are. This is also uh, one of the Akhenaten and Nefertiti's um, kids, too. So, so you find this in, in Egypt, uh, the Kurds, or the, the watchers part of that. You'll see this, too. It was done in Africa, also islands around New Guinea and stuff like that. This was taken in the Belgian Congo. This baby is has, having its head bound. I mean, that is the top of his skull up there. And uh, so this, in modern historical times, this was still being done uh, even up into the 50s, 1950s. I was told by a German lady that, the, that she uh, knew a Kurdish family who lived in Germany, and the, and the kids, too, still had this elongated skulls. So again, as I say, we don't know why they did this and, uh, and whether they were trying to imitate extraterrestrials, whether this, there's something like you, by doubling your cranial capacity, you were somehow smarter and your psychic powers were more developed. Well, so the whole idea, really, that ancient civilizations had high technology um, seems, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to really sort of imagine sometimes. You think, well, did they have TV back then? You know, well, they had to have electricity, I guess. They had to have metal working. Uh, if you're going to have flight, uh, you're gonna, you, need, you need metals and electricity, and plus you need aerospace science. Well, they did have electricity, and it's, it's, it's been proven that uh, the ancients knew about electricity. They had batteries. This is the famous Baghdad battery that was uh, today in the Baghdad Museum. It was a simple battery for, that created DC power. They think it was used for electroplating things. Uh, the idea of complicated machinery. This is what's called the Antikythera device. It's today in the Athens Museum. It was found uh, in the year 1900 by sponge divers in the Aegean off this small island called Antikythera. And they brought up this, this, uh, this box. And it had, uh, it had Greek um, inscriptions on it. And it was a computer. And it wasn't until like the um, 1950s that uh, Americans uh, scientists started studying this thing, and then it, it was a Scientific American article. And uh, they said in you know, the 1950s, they said, boy, finding something like this, you know, is like finding a jet plane in the tomb of King Tut. You know, we, we just never imagined that the ancients had stuff like this. And that, in fact, the Antikythera device, very complicated. All these cogged wheels, was more sophisticated than any kind of Swiss clock. It was essentially a computer that you could dial up, and it was for navigation. Um, 
And it's, it, it was made uh, about 300 BC, and the inscription on the Antikythera device says what it is. So the idea that they had, it was this box, I mean, apparently, and it was made on the island of Rhodes, by the way. So this is what the Antikythera device was like. When you go to Egypt, uh, at the uh, Temple of Dendera, is this famous, it, down inside a crypt, you see these things that look like these electric light bulbs and things like that. You see cords coming out. Well, well this is a drawing of pretty much what it looks like. And there, there are several of these depictions in Dendera. You have what appear to be these like uh, bulb kind of things. Um, and then like, like a filament as a snake. There appear to be cables coming out. They're like attached to these boxes. These are uh, Jed columns associated with Osiris, so they're holding these things up. Uh, the Jed columns themselves, a lot of it looks a lot like some kind of oddball electrical device, possibly used to light temples and stuff like that. The mainstream Egyptological explanation for this is, get this, that this, this is an aroma of a flower, and that this down here this is a lotus flower and that what is the bulb and the, the serpent or something, it's, it's just the aroma of the, the fragrance of the flower. That's how they try to explain this. So you got sacred baboons and things like this, but you know, apparently the idea is that during, and in my book, Technology of the Gods, I have a whole chapter of this about uh, temples that were allegedly lit by lights and that even you know, in historical times, you would go to certain temples in the Mediterranean and Greece and Egypt, and that would be something you would see, like there would be electrical light or something in it. And David, where is this located? This is in uh, southern Egypt at a temple called Dendera. This is in Dendera? Yes. It's down inside a, a crypt. You have to go down inside it. in a crypt? Yeah. Oh, it's not on the walls. There, there, there is some depictions like that on the walls, but that is down inside a crypt. You have to go in a special place for that. Yeah. Right. Okay, so now, I mean, the whole idea, you've got, uh, all right, you've got electricity, you've even got, like, complicated machines and things like that. Um, in order to really, you know, build cities like we do today, you need earth-moving equipment. Uh, you need um, bulldozers and dump trucks and things like that. This is what's called a zoomorphic glyph. This is from Panama. Um, one of my favorite authors, Ivan T. Sanderson, had uh, talked about this in one of his books. So this is actually made out of solid gold, and uh, they think that it's possibly an emerald stone that's right here. This is, and it kind of seems like a monster. Look in the back here, there's kind of a bladed uh, cog wheel back here. You have other blades right there. This is a top view of it. This is the back part over here with these different blades. Here's the monster. This is this stone. This thing is solid gold. Gold, by the way, is, is indestructible. All, all gold from ancient times still exists today. You cannot really destroy gold uh, it's, it, as a metal. But as a metal, it's impractical for really, except for electrical devices, it's, it's impractical for really making these. It's just too soft. Here's the front view of this. It even has a kind of like a skid plate or something on the front. It is like this monster. And this is a drawing, again, of what it looks like. And again, the blade and stuff like that, and this cogged wheels. And it looks a lot, Ivan T. Sanderson thought, well, this thing is like a, a backhoe, some kind of heavy machinery. And it, but it, again, it's what they call zoomorphic glyph. It's, it's, a, uh, it's, and it's just a pendant. You know, it's about four inches long. This is what it looks like here. But, you know, apparently it's, it's a kind of a, a, a zoomorphic monster created from what was a heavy machinery. Uh, a backhoe is used for, you know, digging up trenches and things like that. So this is also from an old sci-fi thing of uh, kind of this is what we would also call a zoomorphic um, uh, heavy machinery where, yeah, it's, it's really a machine, but it's looking like some monster or something that's out there digging. So the whole idea of flight is a fascinating one to me, and is where you get into your chariots of the gods and ancient astronauts, uh, your vimanas and things like that. This is actually uh, in the Gold Museum in Bogota, Colombia, and it is apparently this delta wing kind of jet fighter kind of a thing. 
It looks exactly like an airplane. It's got the, the tail feathers, looks like really a, a Swedish Saab type jet. Um, this is side view right here. Birds do not have tails like this. And, uh, but, you know, again, that when within mainstream archaeology, I mean, you can't have pendants. This is also solid gold. You can't have pendants of airplanes. Well, airplanes didn't exist, you know, so it's got to be a bird or a bee or a flying fish or something like that. That kind of thing. Even at the Gold Museum in Bogota, they put them in like a little Delta squadron, you know, for you to, to see them, you know. It's like, that's how, you know, this flying fish flying around or something. And, you know, now when they were looking at the Antikythera device in the 50s, the American scientists, and they, they were like, wow, we never imagined, you know, that the Greeks had these complicated machines and stuff like this. And it was like a jet plane in the tomb of King Tut. Well, they have actually found models of airplanes in uh, tombs in Egypt. And this is one. This was found in Saqqara right here. So it was this, like a, just a small model of an airplane. When you're at uh, the, you know, also in southern Egypt, at Dendera, uh, or at Abydos, I mean, you see up on a lintel, I'm using a telephoto lens here, but there's this really rather curious depictions. This thing here looks like a helicopter right up here. You might have seen this before. Uh, this is actually a well-known uh, Egyptian hieroglyph. This thing right here looks also like, kind of like a little jet or something like that. And I mean, this is totally real in Egypt, and it's high up on a on a lintel in this this temple. And uh, you know, Egyptologists have a tough time explaining it. They with this one, they say that that's two glyphs uh, carved over each other to make it look like a helicopter. That's that's what they say. And there is there isn't a glyph that's like this one that like with the tail. This one over here, as I've talked to Egyptologists, they don't know what this is, and and I'm not an Egyptologist, and I don't read hieroglyphs and things. But I'm, 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 I'm told that, yeah, there are certain, as you go around Egypt, there are certain oddball hieroglyphs that appear occasionally. Some are very common, and you see them all the time. But others are, like, unique, and they don't know what they mean, and they're, and they're not seen except in the odd few places. And this is, both these are definitely like that. This one, particularly, this one they try and explain as, as two glyphs superimposed on each other. So they do appear to be like planes. This is what this one looks like close up. The whole idea of people flying chariots of the gods, flying carpets, is a common in uh, the flying birdmen. It's, it's uh, something that appears in almost all cultures around the world. That was, and even the Polynesians, if you go to Samoa, they say that the kings of Polynesia lived on this remote little island, which is today in American Samoa, called Manoa, and that they, and they, they could fly. And those guys flew, you know, from island to island and stuff. That's what they say. The Chinese, this is from an old Chinese uh, woodcut of these people, and they would fly through the air, and they're flying. Uh, the Kebra Nagast, which is Ethiopian book, talks about King Solomon and Queen of Sheba. He supposedly would fly to Ethiopia, and because they had a kid together and stuff like that. Um, is that a donor? Yeah, this is from, this is one of my, this was from a, a, just a cartoon of a guy, because it, you can buy, the Kebernagast is, is not an easy book to get. You can, if you look around, you can buy it. But Wallace Budge, who translated Egyptian Book of the Dead, was a translator that Kebernagast. And so in, when it first came out in England, people always talked there was a curious chapter in it that Solomon would fly around and, and go to stuff. So they do this cartoon, yeah. Was, as I remember, Solomon flying out to visit Queen of Sheba and, well, brings his radio too. You know. <laughs> so uh, up here, this is a, a Syrian cylinder seal uh, flying disc. Three guys are apparently flying in this disc and uh, going somewhere. When you read, you know, uh, when you read like a, a novel by someone, what they're going to, you know, they suddenly the hero, uh, you know, goes to the airport, jumps on a jet, flies to London or whatever. And, a, you know, a, a novelist isn't going to suddenly stop and tell you what an airplane is because you, you know. They, you know. You know what an airplane is and they know you know. So when you're reading ancient texts like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and stuff like that, 
They talk all this time about these Vimanas, these aircraft, but they don't go into great detail about them. But the ancient Indian texts uh, did, are, they read like the wildest science fiction. They're like some Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon story where everybody's uh, flying around in these machines, they're having these horrific wars, entire cities are devastated and stuff like that. And it all seems like fantastic fiction until in the 40s and 50s, British and Indian and Pakistani archaeologists started excavating these cities like Mahenjo-daro, uh, Harappa, Kodigi, which are out in the Sin Desert, which is today essentially the border of Pakistan and India. Some of these cities are in Pakistan, some are in India. Uh, some are underwater, like Dwarka. Uh, Graham Hancock's new one of his books uh, was Underworld, has a lot of the sunken cities that they're finding around India and stuff like that. They find that these cities are well planned. They had uh, separated hot and cold running water. They were very high, well-built cities, built out of, out of bricks, actually. Uh, there's a kind of a hieroglyphic script that hasn't been deciphered. Uh, this animal is like a seal. This is an extinct kind of a bull, some ancestor to the Brahma bull. And one of the interesting things about Mahanjadara, when they got to the ground level, archaeologists, they found people just lying dead in the streets. This, some doom had taken over the city. Everybody was dead. And they were just lying in the streets, dead, holding hands and stuff like that. And it was mystery to archaeologists. No one buried the dead. I was like, everyone in the city was killed. Uh, like, and, then, and, and then the desert came and just blew dust over the city and buried it for you know, thousands of years until the 1950s when they, when they came and excavated them. And this was what was talked about in the Mahabharata and these ancient Indian epics of these devastating wars and cities completely destroyed and, and suddenly the archaeologists are finding that. When you're in uh, India and Southeast Asia, any Hindu or Buddhist has heard of a Vimana. They are the chariots, they, they, the different gods fly through the air. Um, the whole thing, idea of the Rama Empire, Rama was from this area up here called Ayodhya and the Ramayana. He supposedly flies down to Sri Lanka in his Vimana. He's getting his wayward wife who's run off with this other guy. And he's going to go get her and bring her home kind of thing. And so when you read the ancient Indian epics, Ramayana, Mahabharata, you know, they keep talking about these aircraft and these airships, but they don't go into details. Well, in 1908, in the Royal Baroda Library in, uh, near Mysore, India, they found an entire book just about Vimanas. And uh, they, it was written over 2,000 years ago. It says that it itself was uh, compiled from earlier books. And the guy who, uh, Maharishi Bharadwaja, was this you know, ancient Sanskrit author. Uh, modern Sanskrit scholars then retranslated it from ancient Sanskrit into modern Sanskrit. And uh, we, you can get this book from us. It's, it's just a book about these aircraft. They, they call them Vimanas, they, the chapters in the book were all about uh, different kinds of metals. There were uh, four different kinds of Vimanas that they described. One of the Vimanas that's described is, is like a circular discoid flying saucer kind of a craft. There were no f pictures in the book at all, and, but in the 1920s, and this is the dawn of our own era of flight, they began, you know, these Indi Hindu scholars started like looking at, you know, they're like, whoa, what are they talking about? Well, what do these aircraft look like? Well, they put some propellers on it. You know, it, it, it is some kind of discoid craft. It's got all electrical stuff on it. That was the Rukma Vimana. The Tripura Vimana was a kind of like a Zeppelin cigar-shaped kind of craft uh, thing. The, uh, another type of Vimana was the Shakuna Vimana, which was more like an airplane. And then there was uh, a fourth kind, uh, which was kind of like a helicopter. So, you know, the Hindu scholars began, you know, they're like, well, all right, we'll just try and figure out what they're saying. The, the texts were detailed, but it, it, it's still hard for them to make, an, make them out. In the 40s, actually, an Oxford professor uh, named Ramachandra, he wrote a book uh, that was uh, published by Oxford University. And it was a book called War in Ancient India. And it was this totally scholarly book of you know, how they waged war in ancient India. Well, he, one of the chapters in his book was aerial warfare in ancient India. You know? And all his buddies at Oxford, and, and this guy was you know, a Hindu from India. And they said, well, you can't have a chapter about aerial warfare in ancient India in your book. You know, that, they didn't do that. And, you know, and he, he was like, well, but 
the texts talk about that. I mean, that's what they say they did. And, uh, and so in the next edition of his book, in the foreword, he keeps that chapter in, but he writes this whole, you know, uh, story of like, yeah, I have to have this chapter in the book, you know, because, well, I'm a scholar. So uh, a friend of mine who's, who's passed on now, a guy named Bill Clendenin, and, and uh, he lived in Mississippi. He was a kind of famous old UFO guy who would go to all these conferences, and he, uh, he was, it, no Georgia Damsky and stuff. And he was very big on Vimanas, and he had also witnessed a UFO years ago, and he wrote this book called UFO Messengers of the Gods. And he, in that, in, in that book, and then we republished it again, and, and I co-authored part of it, where, you know, he was also looking at the Vimana text and trying to figure them out. Mercury, curiously, is part of what they say that was part of the, the, uh, the stuff in, in Vimanas. Well, mercury is interesting, too, because mercury is a metal, it's a liquid, it's a conductor. Uh, the whole idea, too, in like Greek mythology, mercury is the messenger god, he flies through the air. The whole caduceus is associated with uh, the, the mercury, the, the messenger god mercury. And, you, and Bill Clendenin felt that there was, there was something very key to the caduceus, the vortex activity, the, the, that, that, that mercury was somehow used in these Vomanas was part of the actual you know, aerospace technology they were using. He felt the caduceus was a simplified diagram of what he called mercury vortex engines. Uh, and a, just to, to describe it real simply, it's a kind of a gyro effect. In fact, gyros themselves are anti-gravity. Uh, you know, just go and get a little gyro toy, they're cool. And NASA does experiments with gyros and things like that. The effect that the gyros have is, is, is something for definitely like flying saucers and things like that. Now, there's a type of a gyro you can make with mercury, which is a closed system. Mercury as a liquid is, is spinning inside this gyro. And then you electrify it and put power into it. And then suddenly, you're going to have uh, power. This is the whole idea of Ezekiel's uh, ship of, and wheels within wheels from the Bible where he's also taken into a craft. You have, uh, this is from A Dweller on Two Planets, this, the strange book that was published in the late 1800s, Philos the Tibetan, where it claimed he had all these past lives in Atlantis. This was the book that made Mount Shasta famous too. And that, uh, but in that book too, he said, like Vimanas, he said in Atlantis they had these airships they called them valixes, and that they took power from the atmosphere, and that power was pumped into it. Edgar Cayce says this in his readings, too, that he talks about the terrible crystal and how the power was put in the atmosphere, and, and, and these aircraft drew power from it, like, much like a, a television or radio station or broadcasting power. Nikola Tesla was... Uh, uh, Serbo-Croatian inventor who immigrated to the United States, worked for Edison for a while. Uh, he's probably the greatest inventor who ever lived, though most people have never heard of him. And he's, he's like a suppressed person today, but he invented alternating current, and the whole world is lit by his inventions today. He later then invented, after he became quite wealthy and rich, and New York City was the first city ever uh, electrified in a modern sense, um, then, in, uh, and so, you know, the, the turn of the century came. Uh, Tesla and Westinghouse introduced a lot of their technology at the Chicago World's Fair in the, in the late 1890s. And then, you know, by, by 1910 and World War I, really the whole world was being electrified by Tesla's inventions. But it was then that Tesla started, came up with this unusual invention, that, these towers. And Tesla began right after World War I uh, he began in Colorado Springs testing these towers and what he called this transmission of power through these power towers. Tesla would uh, give interviews and articles to the mag popular magazines at the time. Electrical Experimenter was one. And he would describe these electric airships that were powered by his towers. They, uh, they were anti-gravity. They didn't have propellers. They didn't have engines like we think. They were all electric. 
this was a kind of concept of what Tesla had. These towers, he started to, he built the prototypes in Colorado Springs, then he was building the real towers in Long Island at a place called Wardenclyffe. This is uh, early, this like uh, from 1918 or something. But these powers were there, they're pumping power into the atmosphere. You've got these airships, powerful searchlights. They're drawing power from these towers. And here again, this kind of thing. There's this tower, it's like a TV, a radio tower. It's putting power out. And uh, these you know, craft, here's actually some kind of an aircraft battle is going on. This was all of Te Tesla's idea. I mean, he was the greatest genius who ever lived. I mean, he, he could have made this work. But he had J.P. Morgan uh, funding him. Uh, later, what happened was it became kind of an energy conspiracy where they decided they didn't want this. It was kind of tantamount to free energy because because electricity would be all around us. And you wouldn't have to plug something into wires and things like that. A, a lamp or something would take, just need an antenna on it. I mean, you could like literally put an electrical device anywhere on a table and turn it on. And, but Westinghouse and these guys didn't want to get involved. They didn't want to be um, making appliances. They wanted to just sell electricity and power to people. Well, a curious group that started in Milwaukee and Chicago eventually ended up in California in, in the 40s. They began in the 30s. They were called the Lemurian Fellowship. And they published the sequel to A Dweller on Two Planets called Earth Dweller Returns. And they claimed in there that these power towers in Atlantis were like these Tesla towers, but that they were these massive monolithic crystals. That, and they called them the Max Towers. And that these towers were putting out power into the... Um, uh, into the atmosphere, similar to the Tesla towers and stuff like that. Well, and it's interesting too, in the last couple of trips that I've been to Egypt, I've become really fascinated with the whole obelisks. And as you start going to Egypt and you start seeing, you know, you, you, you start realizing that, yes, yeah, some of these things are dynastic Egyptian structures, others are really pre-Egyptian. And Egypt itself lasted for such a long time, thousands of years, but these obelisks, and this is the one at Karnak Temple in, in Luxor, I mean, archaeologists cannot figure out today how these things were cut, how they were moved, uh, how they were erected. And they can't duplicate it today. Uh, they are huge, essentially, towers of granitic crystals. They are one piece all by themselves. This is the unfinished obelisk that, at Aswan that was also would have been one of the largest blocks ever quarried and moved in the world. No modern construction company could actually move this and take it out of here. They don't. Here's Chris Dunn, who we'll be seeing later. He's down inside the, the quarrying. You can just see how massively huge this thing is. And it, I mean, it's part of the whole thing is like, why, why with all these megaliths, why are you going through this tremendous effort to move these things? I mean, it's, it's like superhuman. Uh, and Egyptologists and archaeologists and like, with Incas, whatever, well, you just got to get those thousands of people with their brute force trying to move these things, you know. Yeah, you know, you, you scratch your head. And even then, you know, it's just, you know, how they, how they can. I mean, they would have to erect an obelisk, and they, you know, this is one theory. They had to literally build a mountain, you know, and then get the obelisk up on it and then somehow drop it down. I, it's, it's fantastic efforts for for what are kind of dubious uh, construction projects that you're going you know, to like. And that was something else I found about obelisks was I'm like, well, what, are, what did the Egyptians supposedly think obelisks were and what were they for? Well, they symbolized a ray of the sun. Okay. I mean, they were just a symbolic thing of the ray of the sun. These massive giant towers that, uh, I mean, we, that you, even today we can't figure out how they would have erected them. Now get this, and we're just finishing up. Incredibly. And with my book, Extraterrestrial Archaeology, there are obelisks on the moon. There is an area of the moon known as the Blair Cuspids. The Russians themselves got very, very interested in this. These are the Blair Cuspids down here. Uh, through the shadows that they're showing on the moon, this is what the Blair Cuspids supposedly look like on the moon. And uh, it is an area, there's a, with the Blair Cuspids, it's, it's this massive tower that's like an obelisk with other smaller obelisks and stuff like that around it. So, uh, and that is, Questions? yeah, and I've gone over my time by a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. We will, uh, by the way, in our 
the next presentations with uh, Stephen Mailer and Lana Vatsiris and then Christopher Dunn later, you'll, you'll, get a, you'll get more of this. And these, these guys will go into a lot more detail, and, and Chris too, about the technology. I will be around. We'll have lunch, but let, let's go ahead and take a question or two. Is there a theory uh, yeah, Paul. why the answers to these construction questions have not been found in any of the hydrocarbons? Well, you know, I, well, I should maybe let Stephen answer that one. But part of the thing is, too, the Egyptians, this is a lot like with the Incas and stuff, is that uh, when you build things like this and erect some obelisk or whatever, when you're building on that kind of a scale, giant buildings built out of huge blocks, you know, that are either monolithic or, or locked in together, they're going to last for thousands of years. I mean, they, they are made to be indestructible. And, and that's something I sometimes talk about, too, is that in the ancient times, this, you know, today we live in such a consumer society. Uh, even products we buy have planned obsolescence in them. Car manufacturers, don't, they don't want your car to last that long. They want your car to fall apart after five years, so you'll get a new one. So what uh, well, right, and that, and that these buildings are so old, you know, that thousands of years have gone by, and they're still standing there, but people have long since, you know, forgotten, like, how they were built, uh, who built them, and, and why. And when you go to, like, Teotihuacan in Mexico City, the giant pyramids just outside of Mexico City, uh, and, which are quite impressive, they don't know who built those. Um, they, they existed before the Aztecs and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, they, the, the Aztecs and the Mixtecs and people, their myths say, oh, well, giants built those pyramids, you know, uh, at the beginning of the world. Because they, no one can remember anyone actually building them. You know, they were just always there. Yeah, Walter. Um, when, you, uh, when we were up there at Kumapunku, you told us about there's the legend how Kumapunku Tumapu was built in a day by giants, but also the part of the legend that when they abandoned the city or left it, they took all this machinery or something with them and left behind the foundation of the city. Okay, right, right. And there are a, a lot of areas of Peru, especially, you see giant weird blocks, and it seems like there's like sockets for machinery and stuff like that. Along those lines, too, one time when I was at ARE in Virginia Beach, and Zai Was was there, and Mark Lerner, who are who are popular at ARE, they invite them to come there all the time, but they're total skeptics and all this and, and are real upfront about it. But Mark Lerner said at, at this one conference, and which bears into what I was just talking about here, he's, you know, he's saying, yeah, I know you all believe in Atlantis and stuff like that. He said, but I'm, I'm looking for that Merce Atlantean Mercedes-Benz out in the desert, but I can't find it. And, you know, and so that was, for him, that was it. You know, it's like, well, if the Atlanteans, you know, had all these machines and things, well, why don't I go out in the desert and find one of them? Well, you know, on the surface, that seems to make sense, but it doesn't. It's, you're not going to find that. It, it's not going to be there. Um, and that's part of that thing with those, those metal clamps and stuff like that. When I lived in Sudan, and I worked with a catering company that was catering to Chevron Oil and the oil exploration there, and I would drive a Land Rover around in these remote parts of Sudan, and I knew if I left my Land Rover there and it broken down, and I came back a week later, it wouldn't be there. And it wasn't like somebody would drive it away. People would literally dismantle that entire Land Rover and make spearheads and daggers and swords out of it. I, I saw them do it. And it would happen not in thousands of years. So, I mean, the first person wandering through a desert, seeing any piece of metal, any useful thing, is going to take that. And it's gone. You know, so it won't last. Okay, we'll just take one, one more question, or a couple more questions. Yeah, ma'am. Are there skeletons radioactive? There is some talk about some of them being radioactive and stuff like that. That's mentioned in a Russian book, yeah. And whether they're actually radioactive, um, don't know. There's a curious thing, too, in Malta, along those lines, that goes along with the skeletons in, in Mohenjo-Daro. Uh, I was told that at Ngozo, this German university had, was doing excavations, and they found 30 skeletons of people, all decapitated. And when they tried to use carbon-14 on those skeletons to date them, they couldn't find any carbon-14 in them. And that means carbon-14 will, will date something to about 30,000 years. So, you know, you can't date, you know, dinosaur fossils or anything like that with carbon-14. Carbon-14 only works on fairly recent things, you know, 
But most bones are going to be, if it's 30,000 years or younger, carbon-14 is going to date it. But they couldn't date those skeletons because there was no carbon-14 in them, so, which meant they were over 30,000 years old. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to know about the megalithic you know, blocks that have been found on Kauai. Kauai? Yes. Okay. Did you live on there? I've, I've heard about some of those, and they ascribe them to the Manahunis, these small people. In fact, there's a, a curious thing was just in the news. It'll be in our next magazine. Uh, in Indonesia now, this is just in the last few months, they found this village, uh, this archaeologists, and this was a town inhabited in ancient times by all these like little mini people, all right? And it's the first time archaeologists have said, yeah, I mean, this, we have this whole island full of like, you know, dwarf midgets running around like mini pygmies. And that is, a lot of Pacific Islands are like that. And then on Kauai, they ascribe those megaliths and those channels there pools and stuff, and they ascribe them to these Manahuni mini people. I'm going to be around all day. I am your host, and uh, you can, I'm over here. You can ask me questions all today and tomorrow. Right now, look, one of the things I want to tell you, we're going to take a lunch break right now. We'll be back. We'll start again at 2. One thing with the Inn of Sedona here, there is not a restaurant. Uh, so for lunch, you kind of need to. There's Judy's. The closest restaurant is called Judy's right down here if you know that. There's lots of restaurants right around here. And uh, we basically have like an hour and a half now for um, lunch. Yeah. Let, me, let me tell you what's there. Judy's actually is a very nice restaurant. And, it, and their lunches are good and they're uh, not overly expensive. On the other hand, if you just want a sandwich or something, just beyond.